so much to talk about. Let's welcome on in to the program uh, our old friend Hans von Spikowski, manager of the Election Law Reform Initiative and senior legal fellow at the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. And uh, Hans, always great to have you on at WMAL. I've got to ask, I mean, this story just came out, so I'm going to have to uh, ask you to bear with me. This is the headline from the Washington Examiner. You know that the uh, the document that was leaked online last night uh, on the clerk's office website, well, now, and turns out that was literally a mirror of what was to come later on in the evening. Well, now, apparently, the Fulton County Clerk's Office claims uh, that document was uh, fictitious and it was actually a test. Now, last night, um, you had uh, the DA there, uh, Willis, she sort of blew the whole thing off, which was like, well, I don't know what happens in the clerk's office. I, I don't know. I don't know. She didn't, you know, as a district attorney, she didn't seem, you know, real concerned about all of that. I really don't know what to make of it. I don't work in these uh, types of circles, but there's all kinds of theories about what actually happened. How big of a deal is it that that document was uh, posted to the website even before the grand jury had voted on all this? Oh, I think it's a very big deal. And I, look, I'm very familiar with Fulton County because not only <laughs> not only am I a, a lawyer licensed in Georgia, I actually used to be a county election official in Fulton County. And I will tell uh-huh. you that the clerk's office there has no credibility with me whatsoever. Neither does um, the district attorney there, Fannie Willis. And I think that's just another potential sign of the spurious partisan nature of this indictment. Look, I, Dan, I, I just finished drafting an almost 3,000 word analysis of this ind- indictment. And I will tell you, um, I, I, the polite term that I can use is to say this is, this is one of the biggest piles of manure I have ever seen. And I've been <laughs> practicing law for almost four decades. Um, this indictment takes all of these perfectly legal, lawful actions that are protected under the First Amendment and tries to criminalize them. And look, you can see that when you read through all of the acts that Willis claims were criminal violations of the law in furtherance of the conspiracy. And what does she list? Public speeches given by... Donald Trump, press conferences where people like Rudy Giuliani spoke, tweets. She actually says that, for example, when uh, uh, Donald Trump put out a tweet saying, oh, I'm watching the Georgia hearings of the Georgia legislature where they're investigating what happened in the election uh, on, on a particular network, amazing that was part of an overt criminal conspiracy to send out a tweet like that. That is that is one of the nuttiest theories um, I have ever heard. I mean, there just isn't any legal basis for all the claims that she's making in this indictment. Well, I guess, I guess Hans uh, von Spakovsky is joining us uh, on the Vince Colonnade Show, WMAL. So I, I guess I'm, I'm listening to, to you, and I've listened to others who— are echoing what you're saying, although I love that you're getting into some real nitty-gritty detail here as we see this indictment. And is there any kind of accountability or, you know, she she's putting out all of these, I think you used the term spurious, you know, she's putting out all of these claims, which, as you say, have no real legal basis. This is a district attorney. And, and so I, I guess the question is, okay, so these indictments are out and we'll see what happens ultimately. But You know, there's nothing really that the Republicans can do about all this except let, you know, the uh, let the trial happen. Right. I mean, what what else can they do? Well, unfortunately, that probably is all they all they all they can do, although I have to do say I I have to say um, I think ultimately um, the defendants in this case uh, need to file complaints with the State Bar Association over her because I think she is violating parts of the professional code that govern um, the conduct of prosecutors there. And one of those rules very specifically says that prosecutors are not supposed to file uh, complaints and prosecute a charge that's not supported by 
probable cause. And I think she's, I think she's violating that. Second, um, look, I, she reminds me of, I mean, first of all, look, prosecutors, unfortunately, can get away with a lot, even in the, in the wrong. On the other hand, she reminds me of the former local prosecutor in the Duke lacrosse case. I don't know if you remember this. You know, he oh, was boy. disbarred in North Carolina for knowingly pursuing a false rape case against members of the Duke lacrosse team. And why did he do it? Because he thought it would boost his political career in the next election. And I frankly think that's what's going on here. Fan, look, Fannie Willis is an unknown local prosecutor, one of hundreds around the country, and I think she sees this as her ticket to national prominence with her political party, and I think this feeds her political ambitions. Well, it, you know, when you talk about racketeering and you right. know, the RICO charges, I mean, you're talking about, you know, 18, 19 people, everybody, you know, sort of working on Trump's team, trying to trying to clarify some things that happened uh, during the election of 2020. And as everyone remembers, back in that time, there was a lot of reports. There were a lot of things that were going on. And so the long term ramifications, if ultimately this does end up with some sort of a, you know, a, a guilty charge for Donald Trump, then that sets a, a pretty dangerous precedent for people who simply want to ask questions. No, that is exactly right. Uh, she is basically saying that you're engaging in criminal conduct if you question the outcome of an election. And and look, I, I, we need to point out, remember, the the key to this is her saying that all of the claims that um, uh, Donald Trump and, and his allies and others were making about the 2020 election were false, not only in Georgia, but in – she names all these other states, too, where – she doesn't, she doesn't have jurisdiction over them. But look, keep in mind that, remember, Texas actually filed a motion with the U.S. Supreme Court asking for permission to file a complaint against some of these same states, including Georgia, because of their concern over uh, the validity of the elections in those states and the irregularities that they saw. And 17 other states filed an amicus brief supporting what Texas was doing. Yep. In essence, Fannie Willis is saying that 18 state attorneys general um, were engaging in a criminal conspiracy because they were raising claims about what happened in the 2020 election. And that is how, again, how nutty, uh, how nutty her, her theory is. So I guess, <laughs> I guess then the question is, um, where does this go? I mean, it's going to go to, you know, the um, what, what I'm seeing, Hans, is is that they're thinking that this is going to ultimately because it is Fulton County, they'll end up with a, you know, a, a guilty verdict and, and then it'll you know lose on appeal. It'll collapse on appeal. Is that kind of where you see this whole thing going or do you have a do you have a maybe a different theory? Oh, no, I think that is where it's going. Uh, look, neither Donald Trump nor any of the 18 other de co-defendants, all of whom are Republican, have a chance in heck of getting a fair trial in Fulton County. It is just like the District of Columbia, where the federal indictment was filed, just like Manhattan, where the, uh, the local prosecutor also filed indictment. It is a Democrat-dominated county, uh, overwhelmingly voted for Joe Biden in the last election, and uh, there's no way that these defendants can get a fair trial, uh, despite the lack of facts and law su supporting the indictment. Now, for forgive my uh, legal na uh, naivete. Can can they ask for this to be moved out of Fulton County into, I don't know, some other, you know, fair district somewhere uh, there in Georgia? Yeah, they they have. I have no doubt they will file a motion for a change of venue to get it into a different county. But who is it they have to file it with? Uh, the judge, you know, that's assigned to the case. And, you know, I just don't trust that um, a judge in Fulton County is going to yeah. do the right thing and, and move it to a different venue.
What do you think about this whole, you know, this whole notion that she's going to prosecute all the defendants at once? Is, is that something that you've is that normal in in legal circles? I, I that, that is like impractical. I mean, how how can you defend? I mean, how can how can you prosecute 18 people all at the same time with all of their lawyers and everything else? And And by the way. This indictment is an unbelievable attack on the American legal system and the way it works. Why? Because she has indicted Trump's lawyers, lawyers who were providing him with advice and counsel and representing him before the state legislature and in court. That is, again, um, an attack on the way our system works. We, We have a legal system, an adversarial legal system in which every individual no matter what they've done is entitled to a lawyer and the fact that a lawyer may make claims that turn out later to be wrong or are ultimately turned down by a court doesn't mean that they are part of whatever crime or criminal conspiracy that their defendant committed and yet well it yeah and yet she's <laughs> indicting the lawyers you you've heard the the one hour phone call um, or one hour or so phone call that uh, former President Trump had with the election officials. Uh, I assume you've heard it. And, and so oh, yeah, when, I've read the transcript. So when I listen to that and, and when I read about it, there seems to be two different takes on that phone call. And I, I played some audio uh, from it earlier, so hopefully folks heard it. But one of the things that people say is that Donald Trump is is bullying these election officials and and I'm listening to this and as I was telling folks earlier Donald Trump is is trying to clarify some things but you know they're giving it right back to him I mean it is a very adult contentious conversation but Donald Trump at least my take on it Trump isn't bullying them he's trying to clarify some stuff and and they're telling him he's wrong it's almost like you know when you have a disagreement with uh, you know somebody that you work with i mean th- th- to me there's no bullying it was very simply a contentious conversation where the president was trying to clarify th- some things and they were certainly not shy in telling the president that he was wrong so i don't i don't see in my non-legalistic brain anything wrong with that phone call well, there wasn't anything wrong with it. Your analysis is exactly correct. And uh, you wouldn't know this unless you work your way through 100 pages of the indictment. That phone call is not part of the indictment. Which I thought was fascinating because that's yes. the yes. that's what everybody keeps uh, in, in the media. They were talking about this phone call as, you know, one of the core pieces of of evidence, but you're right. It wasn't in the uh, it wasn't in the indictment. Were you surprised by that? Well, I wasn't surprised from the standpoint of I read the transcript of that call, and there was nothing illegal. There were no unlawful actions in that call whatsoever. So I would have been surprised if it was part of the indictment. Of course, she lists all these other things that are also perfectly legal and perfectly lawful and claims that they're somehow a violation of the law. So uh, I, I, I got to tell you, uh, if she had been my student in law school, I would have given her an F in constitutional law because she clearly doesn't understand the protections of the First Amendment. Well, here's the thing, though. I mean, you said it earlier, and this may or may not be our place to talk about this, but you know, you said she doesn't know. My contention is that she does know and she doesn't care because of those, you know, career or political ambitions. Now, do you do you believe uh, you 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 know about the Alvin Bragg case in, in, of course, Manhattan? You know about this. Right. Um, of, of these four indictments, I, I see so, a lot of these lawyers on the left. Right. They say, well, this is the one that's going to take Donald Trump down. We've got a lot of people on the right, such as yourself. Well, I don't even I don't know if you're on the right, per se. I don't mean to you know, make assumptions. But, you know, constitutionally, I have a lot of people that I respect saying this is absolute hogwash. Do you have an opinion? Is, is this is this worse or or, you know, shakier legal foundation than Alvin Bragg's in Manhattan? Which is worse, do you think? I, I think they're all extremely shaky. Uh, the one in Manhattan 
the Fulton County one and the federal one we just filed in the District of Columbia. I think actually the case that poses serious problems for him is uh, the federal case over his retention of classified documents down yeah. in Florida. Now, I do think that case was also overcharged. And I'll be the first to tell you that we apparently have a two a two tiered system of justice now inside the U.S. Justice Department when they're trying to maximize charges against Donald Trump and yet minimize the very serious um, felony violations against uh, Hunter, excuse me, Hunter Biden. Um, oh yeah, the, it, it's, it, the, it's a classified it's a classified document case that that actually presents serious uh, risks for the former president. All right. We'll have to see what happens and we'll leave it there. Hans von Spakovsky joining us uh, from the Heritage Foundation. Very much appreciate you being with us here on WMAL. It is 422.